My, uh, my notes tonight, I was supposed to give you guys these awesome study guides to follow along with, but it never happened. And so you guys have blank sheets of paper for our notes tonight. Um, I'm just going to get right into it. Uh, with all of the, the madness that's going on with what's going on in our culture, in our nation, and uh, it, it actually really started before, but also kind of culminated at the storming of the Capitol building. I was working and I ended up just going on social media to see all of this mess. And uh, I just, I was like, man, Lord, I see all of the different voices and from professing Christians on both sides, not even both sides, there, there's all different sides of the issues that are, uh, really important in our culture. And I just felt the Lord drawing me out of that and saying that that's not where the focus and the emphasis of the church needs to be. And he started preparing this message. Is like, why, how are we so divided as a church, right? When, when we're supposed to be known by our love for one another. Um, and he started developing this message inside of me. And I, I was like, this is impossible to do. Like what I'm attempting to do not with just us, but those who might be watching the, the video, um, it's impossible. I can't do it. I can't teach a changed heart, right? I can't teach a heart into changing. It's something that the Lord has to do. But the Lord says in Romans 1.16, it says that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And so somehow it's God's power and that power is accomplished through a message, through the gospel. And so even though it's impossible for me to change a heart through teaching, right? I don't want to just go through the exercise of, you know, digging up the scriptures and making points and following a logical uh, th framework of thought. I need my heart to be transformed. And, I, and my goal is for the church's hearts to be transformed. You know, a lot of people are talking about this global economic reset. And this, you know, this one of the theories that are out there. And I was just thinking that we need a reset in the church. I always go back to the story of the pastor who just graduated seminary and he said he was so excited at all these apologetic uh, arguments and all these theological truths that he was excited to teach the church. And then he goes into the church and he says, I spent the last 40 years teaching the very basics of the gospel to a very lost and confused church. And the, the reason why is because we try to move on from the gospel. I just sent the elders um, a video the other day about progressive Christians and, and conservative Christians and all these different cultural issues. And I was just like, this is exactly why the elders, we, we don't have time to just program things, to make programs, to get people in seats, to make people feel good. We have to be diligent and faithful in teaching the truths of the gospel. And so I don't, I don't know where everybody stands necessarily on some of the topics that I'm going to be talking about tonight, but uh, I just want to encourage you to not assume that you're not the one that I'm talking to, right? Uh, one time I was in a Bible study with somebody and um, we were in Romans 1. And Romans 1, if you know it, it's pretty heavy on sexual immorality. And he talks about, you know, uh, God was, he made himself plain to everybody. And people are without excuse. Nobody's going to be able to stand before God and say, I did not know you existed. He says, I've given you all creation. They speak to my invisible qualities and my divine attributes. So nobody's going to be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know. And he says, instead, what people do is they take the truth of God and they exchange it for a lie. And they worship and serve the created things rather than the creator. And he, and he tells, talks about this progression in Romans 1 about what happens when, when creatures do that? We stop giving thanks to God. We start glorifying the things that he created. And he says he hands them over to a debased mind, to foolish thinking. And that foolish thinking leads to all kinds of immorality. And he starts talking about sexual immorality. And, and, and he says, you know, uh, women traded uh, natural relations for unnatural ones. And men did the same thing. And I was going through a Bible study with this one brother. And he was like, yeah, man, can you believe it? All those homosexuals. And I was like, you know that we're talking right now because you're living in sexual immorality, right? <laughs> this particular person that I was talking to was having premarital sex and he had issues with porn. And yet he was so quick to talk about those people out there, right? When we look at the text, right? Oh yeah, those, those homos. He's like, no, no, no. Like the, the Bible is supposed to be a mirror. It's not supposed to be a looking glass so that we can see all the problems with the world. The Bible is supposed to be a mirror so we can see God and we can see ourselves in light of who God is and realize we completely need God. And so when I talk about some of these things, just don't assume that I'm talking about other people out there. Just look at if there's any truth in what I'm speaking to you. 
Uh, the, the title of tonight's message is called the, the Unified Voice of the Church on Politics. I'm going to take this off just because I'm getting kind of warm up here. The Unified Voice of the Church on Politics. The reason why I, uh, that, that word kept sticking out to me, the Unified Voice of the Church, because right now we don't have a unified voice. And there, there is supposed to be a unified voice. And, and what is that? And what, what is it on politics? This is such a divisive issue. And I started feeling the Lord leading me to talk about these divisive issues, things that divide Christians, issues of politics, issues of race, issues of certain theological understandings. There's doctrines and denominations, things that people divide over. What is the unified voice of the church on these issues? And tonight is specifically about politics. On, on the, the day of the storming of the Capitol, it, it was a mess. I don't know anybody who's uh, condoning that. Uh, we all reject that. We all believe that, that that should be condemned and people should be prosecuted. I don't know anybody who's saying anything different. But I do go on social media and I see just, again, all this vomit from Christians against each other uh, and making it about issues of race or issues about other things, uh, P- Republican versus Democrat. And I just put a simple post. I put, church, please be silent and pray. That's all I put. Please be silent and pray. Don't weigh in until you have the heart and mind of the Lord in this moment. That's all I put, just be quiet for a moment, church, before you go and spew out your ideas and your opinions and your ideologies, just be silent and pray until you grab a hold of the heart and the mind of the Lord in this situation. Then say whatever you want, because that's gonna be God's thoughts, right? And then even that post sparked controversy and people were like, well, how can we be silent when injustice is happening? How can, it's like, you guys have completely missed the point. My thoughts on this whole matter is uh, that we as a church are far too politically and socially charged and it's damaging our witness. My concern is, yes, I I have thoughts on all of the things and I don't mind sharing those thoughts with people in a conversation when we can go back and forth, but I'm not going to spew out and lob something on social media and then go into uh, a debate with somebody and then drive wedges between my brothers and sisters that are unnecessary. I do have thoughts on them. However, all of those thoughts are so far secondary to the mission of Christ that he's called to all of us, not just me. I feel like we are far too politically and socially charged and it damages our witness. And and I expect it from the world. So like when I go on social media, I'm not condemning the world, right? Paul says, don't judge those who are outside the world. God's going to do that. I'm talking about judging the people that are inside the world because in the world they have no hope. They have no hope, right? Our hope should be in a political leader if there is no hope in Christ. In, in, in perfect justice reigning and, and uh, peace in our land and all of that stuff. If, if my hope is resting in only that, then I could see why I would be losing my mind right now because it's just kind of crazy. But our, our, as Christians, our hope is not in our circumstances. It's not in peace in our land necessarily. It's the Prince of Peace who's going to come to bring perfect justice. And so when I see the church folding and, and acting like the world, then Paul says you need to judge that. You need to call it out for what it is. And right when I said I, I was going to start posting about politics, uh, I started getting the DMs. Everybody's in my inbox from, you know, here's what the voice of the Lord is saying in this situation. It's like, man, the Lord must be really schizophrenic because he's all over the place, right? He's saying this. No, he's saying this. It's like, okay, well, what is the Lord actually saying? In fact, I had to tell somebody last night. I said, look, I'm so far, like I'm burnt out on that, on all of these different voices. I'm just going to go straight to him. And I'm not saying that these things are not important. Right. I, but what I am saying is that, like, man, God has priorities for the church and I feel like we're missing it. So people misunderstand me when I talk like this. I'm, what, I'm not saying politics and social issues aren't important. I think they are. I'm not saying that God isn't concerned with them. I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't have opinions on these things. And I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't even speak on their opinions. But what I am saying is that the body of Christ is ruining its witness because of political stances and ideologies. I am saying that the body of Christ is unnecessarily dividing over issues we're not supposed to divide over. We're we're called all the time in the scripture to unity. And there's only a few things that we're supposed to divide over. And this is not one of them. And I'm saying that we are, we far too often mistake our political identity with our Christian identity and the lines have become blurred between our politics and religion to where people don't even know the difference. I was reading an article the other day about how young people are leaving the church because of its ties to Donald Trump. What does Donald Trump have to do with the kingdom of God? People are leaving Christianity because of their ties. It's, it's close association to a man. I'm not saying I'm for or against or whatever. There's issues and we could talk about that. But the fact that people are leaving the church because of other Christians' close ties to one man who's sitting in office, 
That's a problem when we start to blur the lines between our religion and our politics. Specifically, I'm talking to two Christians. I'm talking to the Christian who has unquestioning allegiance and devotion to Donald Trump. It's exposed your blinded idolatry and your false hope in a sinful man to be the savior of our nation. It's caused a wedge between you and your brothers and sisters who see and have issues with his many imperfections and unwise and often foolish brash speech because you have unquestioning devotion to this man. I'm also talking to the Christian, on the other hand, who has utter hatred and abhorrence for Donald Trump. It's blinded them to the love of Christ and the clear biblical demand to honor, respect, and pray for our God-appointed leaders. Their ungodly disdain for fellow image bearer, which is Donald Trump, he's a fellow image bearer, right? It's caused us to focus on the speck in his eye while ignoring the plank in our own. It's caused the wedge between our brothers and sisters who see things differently when it comes to policies they believe are more in line with biblical values. So we're divided unnecessarily. And again, I have thoughts, but that's not the focus of tonight. So when I said I'm going to talk about politics, I'm not going into specific issues. And if people are expecting that, they're going to be disappointed. From what I see, we're far more politically and socially charged than we are missionally charged. And it grieves the heart of God. Christ gave us one commission. It was in Matthew 28. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Acts 1 and 8 says, You'll receive power on high, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is the church's sole purpose for existence. That's why we're here. It's not to expand a particular political agenda. It wasn't to bring political reform to the broken systems of this world. Our stances and our statements on politics and social issues have hurt our witness to the world, and I feel like we look just like everyone else, especially over how divided we've become. John 13, 35 says, uh, Christ says that we'll know that we are his disciples by the love we have for one another. So my call in, in the message tonight is a call to unify in our day. And, and I pray that like even the, the, the group that's here tonight, that we would just like, even if it's just us who are here, then we go out and we give people a different perspective of how to reply to these things. Because it's going to come up. It comes in issue. It, it comes up in conversation. I have conversations all the time with people. And sometimes people are dissatisfied with the way I respond because they th- feel like I'm, I'm uh, lessening it. It's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm glorifying God. I'm not glorifying that issue. So 1 Corinthians 1.10 is our text. If you have your Bibles, turn there, because I want us to actually all look at that all together. 1 Corinthians 1.10. It says, Now I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all say the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same convictions. Now, I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all say the same thing. That's the title of today's message is the unified voice of the church, that we all say the same thing, that there be no division among us, that we're united with the same understanding and the same convictions. Now, Paul isn't saying here that all Christians have to be the same. He's rather saying that all Christians are united in Christ despite our various understandings, perspectives, personalities, and experiences. He's saying that the church should have a united voice in Christ, even despite our differences on other issues. So I I just want to start with a few things that I think we can all agree on as believers. A few simple statements. The first statement is, Lord, we need you. Like, right, can we, we can agree with that. Lord, we need you. Lord, we don't have all the answers. Right, I see this pride, this puffed up pride in people's conversations that they know what's going on and they're really trying to educate everybody else. Everybody else is so ignorant and they have all the answers. It's like, how about you just step back for a second and realize that you don't have all the answers. You, it, the, the, the most prideful or the most humbling, I should say, the most humbling instance in the Bible I look is the book of Job, right? If there's anybody who had reason to boast, it was this righteous man who didn't deserve all this stuff that was happening to him. And then we have 40 chapters of deep Hebrew poetry about Job just giving his plea before God, like, Lord, I know I'm not perfect, but of all these people, like, this this is not how the world should work. And he's pleading his case, and he said, Lord, you answer me. And the Lord answers him. 
in the whirlwind, and he gives him a glimpse of the universe. And he talks about the complexity of all the different creatures that he's created and all the big creatures that he's created. And then he, he shows him the heavens and he says, you see all of those stars? Were you there when I flung the stars into existence? Do you understand the complexity of what it takes to order the entire universe? And you come and bring your charge against me to give you an answer. And Job, he shuts his mouth and he says, I, I spoke once, but I speak no more. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. And... We have the audacity to go on social media as like a little social media warrior. We're going to affect change by my post. This one post is going to change everybody's mind. It's going to, I'm going to do my part. It's like, dude, you do not have all the answers. So why don't we start with, Lord, we need you. Lord, I don't have all the answers. I think I have some answers, but I'm going to take a humble step back and say, you know what? I really don't understand what's going on. I don't how, see how you're working in all of this, but I do see that you are working in it. And I trust you and I pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't understand how that's going to happen. I don't understand the complexities of how you're ordering the universe. I don't understand the complexities of the hundreds of different countries that are in this world, not just my own little country of 300 million out of what, 7 billion people in the world. We're a small drop in the bucket compared to the entire world. I don't understand how you're orchestrating all of these things to bring to culmination your end result, which is going to be us in eternity. I don't know how you're doing that, Lord. So I don't have all the answers, but I trust you're doing something. Lord, I need you. I need some humility. So with that being said, I think those are some things we should all be able to agree on is, Lord, we need you. Lord, we don't have all the answers. And Lord, we want your kingdom to come. But when it comes specifically to politics, we're going to talk about that tonight. What can we agree on biblically despite fight disagreements politically, right? So I might have certain issues with uh, immigration or certain laws or certain, you know, things that we, we could talk about those issues and, and that's all fun. But what are the things that we can agree on as the church? I feel like if we, we really pay attention to the words tonight, that we can find a place of unity and genuine love for those we differ with on all these different issues. And the first point I want you, th this is supposed to be in your fill-in. So if you have your notes, which is a blank paper for tonight, write this point down. The kingdoms of men are not the kingdom of God. The kingdoms of men are not the kingdom of God. Now, some people differ with that statement or have issues with that statement. I'm not saying that God is not separated from the kingdoms of men or not involved in the kingdoms of men. All the kingdoms of men including the United States of America and Afghanistan, North Korea, all of the kingdoms of men are under the sovereign rule of God. That's without question. He is sovereign. He is king of kings, right? So there's the kingdoms of men and Lord, he's the king of kings. So all of the kingdoms of men are under the sovereign rule of God, but they are not equal to the kingdom of God. And the Bible makes a distinction between the kingdoms of God and the king or the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of men. First uh, John five nineteen. He says that we know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. The whole world is under the sway of the evil one. So we Christians were of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of God, but the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Now check this out. Let's turn there. Matthew chapter 4. I don't think a lot of people realize this text and the implications of what's happening in the garden uh, I'm sorry, in the wilderness as, uh, as Jesus is being tempted in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 8. So this is uh, one of the temptations. Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Again, uh, the devil took him to a very high mountain, okay? And he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And the devil says to Jesus, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus didn't say, those are not your kingdoms to give me. What did he say? He says, Jesus says, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So Jesus does not argue with Satan the fact that he has the ability to hand over these kingdoms to whoever he wants to. How does that happen? Satan is the ruler of the kingdoms of men. What, how, how, how does that work? And this is why I feel like that pastor who had to go back and teach the simple basics of the gospel for 40 years was absolutely right in doing that because we have to go back to the beginning. This is very fundamental. I'm not going to read all of the chapters, but I'm just going to give you the story. And I wrote down all of the different uh, addresses right there through Genesis. That at the very beginning, 
God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates all the animals and the sky and all that stuff. And he, he creates man and, and woman. And he says he makes man and woman in his own image and likeness. And then he's, he told them what? To be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. This earth is yours, human. I am creating this. It is under my sovereign rule, but you are the manager. I am making you the ruler of this world. He hands basically the scepter of the kingdom of earth, the realm of earth, over to man. He says, this is yours to subdue. And we know that man failed at that. We see that in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent comes in in his jealousy and his cunning, and he convinces Adam to forfeit his rightful place as ruler over the earth. What did he do? He didn't just forfeit it. He handed it over to Satan. Genesis chapter 3 is the fall of man. And then Genesis 6, 5, what is the result of that? We know that the flood, that the world, because man failed at our mandate to subdue the earth, the earth now is rampant with sin. And the, it, God is grieved that he even makes mankind and he destroys the world in a flood. Okay, now is this a fresh start? Well, not necessarily, right? So it, Moa and his, no, Moa, Noah and his eight uh, family members, they are rescued and they start populating the earth again. And God already promised he's not going to destroy the world in a flood again. But then what happens? They basically all smack Jesus in the face and they say, we, want, we, want to, we don't want anything to do with you. We're going to build a, a tower. We're going to make a name for ourselves. It says in Genesis uh, chapter 11, they build the Tower of Babel. It says, we're going to make a name for ourselves. We don't care about God. And then what does God do? He scatters them, right? He confuses their language and he scatters the, all the people. This is the birth of nations, right? So the birth of nations, all the nations of men, all the kingdoms of men happen because of man's unified sinful rebellion against God. That sinful, unified rebellion against God didn't stop when they're all scattered in their own nations. That continued, right? In, in Genesis chapter 5, it says, in those days, people called out to God. Why? Because God was so far separated to them. In the, in the garden, he was walking with them in the cool of the day. But it, by the time Genesis 5 comes, it's like men are calling out to God because they're so far separated from him. And then in Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, they're already trying to worship and make something for themselves. He scatters their languages. The, uh, he he uh, confuses their languages and scatters all the nations. And that's the birth of nations. And now all of these sinful nations under the sway of the evil one, are in rebellion against God. And this is where all these different gods come from. All these ancient gods that you hear about are all from these nations that have been scattered. And out of all of these nations that he scattered, he calls one man out. He calls out Abram in Genesis uh, chapter 12. Abram was pulled out of one of these sinful nations. He says, you are going to be someone different. He says, all the kingdoms of men, they're under the sway of the evil one. Okay, I'm going to create a different nation. I'm going to create a kingdom uh, through you, through Abraham a different type of people, kingdom uh, or uh, uh, offspring that would bless all of those nations. Even though all those nations were sinful and they were in rebellion against God, he says, I'm actually going to bless all of them through you, but I need you to come out and to be different and separate from them. And he creates through Abraham, the nation of Israel. The, the point in going through that is to say that like our world is part of the devil's system and our nation is a part of, of that system. We're not separate, right? So if we're looking for perfect political peace in America, and there's this person who's God's man, and that person who's God's man, and that person, like, it's like, no, no, all of them are part of this system. They're definitely under the sovereign rule of God, and he's working out redemptive history through sinful nations, but our nation is no different. We are not actually the, the kingdom of God. America is not the kingdom of God. Since the fall of Adam, and even the garden, the systems of this world have been subversive to the kingdom of God. However, even in their rebellion, they're somehow still working towards his purposes. Uh, I wanted to read um, Psalm chapter 2. So go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 2. We're going to read the whole Psalm. This is how we're supposed to look from God's vantage point about what he's seeing in the world today. Why do the nations rebel? And the people plot in vain. The kings of this earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let us tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraints. O oh, one enthroned in heaven, he laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath. I've consecrated my king in Zion. 
my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. He's talking about Christ here, his king in Zion. This is the coming Messiah. He says, look at all these nations that are plotting and raging in vain. He says they scoff at the Lord. They want to re release their bonds from him. They, they don't even want anything to do with him. And the Lord laughs at them. And he says, hey, I've actually uh, set my king in Zion. I've consecrated my king in Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth, your possession. Again, he's speaking of Christ, that all of the nations will be under the lordship of Christ. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like pottery. Does that include our nation? Yes. If we're here at the coming of Christ, he's going to break all of them with a rod of iron. He's going to shatter all of them like pot pottery. So now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the Son, or he will be angry, and you will perish in your rebellion. For his anger may ignite at any moment. All those who take refuge in him are happy. And the most clear passage on this point that the kingdoms of men are not the kingdom of God is Jesus when he's before Pilate in John 18, 36. Pilate says, are you a king? Is it true? They're saying that you're the king. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom does not have its origins here. He couldn't be any more clear than that, that his kingdom is not of this world. And so we get confused when we start to blur the lines between America, right? I, I was listening to a radio program to where people are like, well, I don't know. I think that this, th this political uh, revival is almost like a spiritual revival to me because I've been praying more and I've been all, he said, and I love what the commentator said. He said, no, no, if this was a spiritual revival, people wouldn't be uh, waving flags saying, USA, 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 they would be on their knees repenting, saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, our nation is ripe right now for revival. The reason why I'm, I'm speaking so passionately about this is because our call as the church is to reach a dying world. The world is dying. They're without hope. And we have the message of hope. And we have an opportunity right now to spread revival, to spread the message of Christ and, be, and really be used. I mean, right now, like during COVID, uh, we, we've said for years that the building isn't the church, that the people are the church. And everybody says that. And right now we have our opportunity to actually put our money where our mouth is. And the church is failing at the most part of that. Why? Because we're protesting. No, you need to let us in the building. Like the building is where it's actually happening. When nothing is stopping us from meeting in homes, meeting in smaller groups, having fellowship nights, nothing is stopping that. But why? We think the main issue is I need my freedom, I need my rights, and I need to be let in the building. It's like, no, that's not what the church was. I did a thought experiment one time in one of our Wednesday night groups, and there's a little bit of a, a bigger group. And so I said, look, let's just pretend that we are a church planting committee right? And we are sent out by a very large mega church and they say money's not an issue. We want you to go into this particular neighborhood and plant a church because there's no churches there. What are some of the things that we would need to plan for? And everybody started listing their things. Well, we need a place to meet. We would need someone to lead us. We would need maybe someone to watch the kids and we would need someone to do some worship. And, and we started making all of our lists. And by the time we had it, we had, you know, chairs, building, worship leader, youth director, all this stuff. And I said, okay, let's take a look. And I named it all. I said, how much of this did you actually get from the scriptures? And it was like nothing, right? It was all of these trapping. And we haven't even talked about like the main things, which is like, we just need the people of God filled with the spirit of God, preaching the message of God to expand the kingdom of God. And that's all the early church had. And he turned the world upside down through them. And so I feel like we have, like our nation is primed for it. In the darkest of darkness, the light shines. The, I was just in that room in the sanctuary. They had to go grab this thing right here. And it was pitch black. And I just got my little cell phone light. And I could turn it on right now. Watch, I'll turn my light on. Like, I, it, there's no difference, right? Because light. But when I was in there, it just lit up. I could see everything. Why? Because it was pitch black. And so right now it might be pitch black, but we have the light of Christ. And so right now we have an opportunity to spread revival and I just don't want us to miss it. So that's why I'm keeping, that's why I'm, I'm speaking with so much passion about this. So, so that's the first point. The kingdoms of men are not the kingdom of God. The second point is um, Christ refused to fit into the political ideologies of his day. He refused. Someone was talking to me the other day. They said, well, well Christ was really political. He cared about politics. And I'm like, did you see 
the mold of politics that they wanted to put him in. You, you, can't, you can't escape the political landscape, right, of the, time, of the appearance of Christ. He didn't just randomly appear at some random time in history and say, I think right now is a good time to, to show up to people. Like, there was a lot of things going on in his day, right? Jerusalem, Israel, they, they had always been in captivity when they were in rebellion. They were, they were waiting for the day that this Messiah was going to come and free them from the bonds of their enemy. And so now Israel is a Roman colony. So they, they were in, in subjection under Babylon, then, they, then under Syria, then they went back to, uh, to their homeland. And then after centuries go by, all this stuff happens. And now they're under the conquest of Rome. And they're just a colony of Rome. Rome is, has conquered them. They, are, they have conquest and they are just a Roman colony, right? And so with that, you can just imagine, just imagine if some other country came here to America or maybe even from within, we've split up somehow and there's other people that have felt feel, uh, conquered, right? There's, there's going to be some factions and there's going to be some political tension. And so in Jesus's day, there was all these extremist groups and there was all these different political understandings. And so um, there, there was uh, the zealots, right? The zealots would be like the extremists, right? The, the rioters, the people that have stormed the Capitol uh, or the people that are breaking in. Uh, anytime there's a peaceful protest, everybody's like, see what you guys did? And there's all this. It's like, no, no, no those weren't the, that wasn't the people that were protesting. Like, there's extremists in the group. There's like thousands of people. You can't say all of them because of these people. It's like, no, there, there's going to be those people. The zealots were the extremists. They were like Jews and they were patriotic. And they were like, how dare you come into our land? And they believed to rebel against the Roman occupation. And so they would cause violence and they would stir up crowds and they would do all these things. That's why they were called zealots. In fact, from them, people in the church today, they're like, oh, those BLM people that are doing all that, they're, they're the zealots or the proud boys and all these things. And you know what's, tr- what's a trip is that Christ made one of the zealots his apostle. Simon the zealot. He, ex- he chose one of these extremist groups to be in his inner circle. So then we have the Pharisees, and they were religious uh, Jews. They had the, this ancient, um, they were an ancient sect of uh, Judaism, and they did not like the Roman occupation, but they were uh, not as violent about it. They were more peaceful about it. And then there were the Herodians. Herodians, these guys are, uh, so, so like Rome comes in, and they, they uh, subdue Israel, right, in Jerusalem. And then they're like, well, we're going to give you your puppet king, and that was King Herod. And so King Herod, he was a Jew, he was the king of the Jews at that time, but basically he was just a political puppet under Rome. And the Jews didn't really accept Herod, uh, the, the, the true like down Jews. They were like, no, we don't like Herod. But the Herodians, they were like, hey, we're all about Roman lifestyle and about all this stuff. We like what they have to do. So we're, we're going to follow what they did. They look, man, they conquest us and they've been good to us. They gave us our own king. They gave us all. So there's all these different groups during Jesus's time. And then Jesus comes into the scene and all the people crowd him. Who is this guy? Which, who, who are you with? Are you with us? Are you with them? Are you with the Pharisees? No, you're not one of the Pharisees. You're dogging them all the time. Are you with us? Are you with the, like, and they didn't know which box to put him in. And he refused to fit into any of their boxes. In fact, that's the reason why he was crucified. Because the Jews were expecting a political Messiah to come and free them from the bonds of Rome. And he did not fit that mold. And so that you're not the Messiah. You're not it. You're not political enough for us. And so they, they test him, Matthew 22. He g- gives us the story. Uh, if you want to turn there, you can. Matthew 22, verse 15. The Pharisees, right? So this one group that has their own political ideology, they went and plotted to trap Jesus by what he said. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians. So they're ganging up with people they don't even agree with so that they could trap Jesus in his political stance. And they say, teacher. And they start to, to rub it on real thick. They try to lay it on him, uh, you know, real smooth like Teacher, they say, we know, uh, we know that you're truthful and uh, teach truthfully in the way of God. You defer to no one, for you show no partiality. So they're, they're brown-nosing him right here. Therefore, tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they're asking a question. They already know their own political stance on it. But they're just like asking it as a question. It's a loaded question. What, what do you think about this? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? This, this Roman occupier who's in our land? Should we pay taxes? And Jesus knew the political assumption of, his, of their question. If he says yes, the Herodians, they're going to charge him with treason. Oh, should you not pay taxes? Uh, well, then you're, that's treasonous. Uh, then if he said uh, uh, no, 
or if he, I'm sorry, if he says, yes, we should pay taxes, then the Pharisees would say he was not for God's people. See, he, he's capitulating to Caesar. He's just a sellout. But Jesus' response was unexpected, and it left them speechless. He says, perceiving their malice, Jesus says, why are you testing me, hypocrites? Which is funny, because they came on all sweet and said, hey, you teach truthfully, you don't show partiality. And he's like, hey, you hypocrite, why are you even asking me that? And show me the coin used for taxes. He said, hey, bring me the coin. Look at the coin. So they brought it to him, and whose inscription and image is on this? They asked, Caesar's. He said, well, then give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed, and they left, and they went away. The issues of taxes and the political boxes that they wanted to put Christ in were so inconsequential to his message. He said, your, your issue is taxes? Is that my image? No, then give it to whoever it belongs to. I don't care about that. That's not why I'm here. It's so inconsequential to my message. It's seemingly like I'm just dismissing the issue. Pay the tax. It doesn't have anything to do with my mission. Why be a hindrance to what I'm trying to accomplish? And they might think, well, if you're the Messiah, you would have more vested interest in jumping on our political bandwagon. And then we see that all the time. I don't see how a Christian could do this. I don't see how a Christian could vote this way. I don't see how a Christian can support this in politics. It's like, you guys are, are thinking so low level that you're missing the whole point. They crucified Christ because they rejected him as Messiah. They couldn't see Jesus through their corrupted worldviews. It was an interesting story when Jesus was confronted by them and, and they just could not see it. And um, he says, guys, you, got, you Pharisees, you know the scriptures really well and you study them diligently every day because in them you think that there's truth. But these are the very scriptures that point to me and, and you don't receive me. He's like, in all of your learning and understanding and theological training, you can't see Christ because you have your, own, you have your mind already made up of who you think I should be. I, I've told it before here, like the, the, uh, one of the times I was praying to the Lord and, um, and one of the times I felt like the Lord actually gave me a, a mental picture, like a vision. It wasn't like an open vision like I see it in reality. It was just a, a thought in my mind, a picture. And I was praying and I was like, Lord, I just want to know who you are. I just want to really know who you are. I just want to get closer to you. I just kept saying, I want to know who you are. And the Lord gave me a picture of a box inside of my brain. And each side of the box represented something different. One side was my sinful nature. Another side was my own desires of what I want God to be like. Another side was the teachings that I was raised up with. The other side was what everybody else says about Christ. And, and I felt that God was saying, you, Sean, are saying you want to know who I am, but you're trying to show, you, you want me to reveal who I am inside of that box. And I'm not in that box. If you want to really know who I am, you have to explode that by what you think I am like, what you've been told that I'm like, and you need to dig into the scriptures with an open mind and really dig about who I am. And that's when I started reading the Bible. It's like, if all I had was the Bible and no other influences, no other people telling me about him, no other predispositions and how I want God to feel. Uh, like, there's certain feelings that I, like, I look at scripture. And I'm like, man, God, you did that? Like, I wouldn't do that. That doesn't sound right or good, but I must be wrong, right? And so I can't have these thoughts about who I want uh, God to be. So the second point was Christ refused to fit into political ideologies of his day. The third point, and write this down, is the Bible urges us to think spiritually, not earthly. The Bible urges us to think spiritually, not earthly. I'm just going to read some texts. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, Since then you've been raised with Christ. He says, you, you're saved, right? You're a saved person. You've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden in Christ God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I tell people all the time, like, look, I'm so far removed from concerning myself with these issues. I feel like God is just having me press into him because there's nothing that I can affect change in that particular thing. So I just feel like God is wanting me to draw closer to him. And I'm like, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stand up for our rights and for worship. But I'm like, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. But he says right here, you've been raised with Christ, so set your hearts on things above, not on earthly things. You're talking about an earthly thing. Like, it would feel really good if I had everything that I wanted, right? It would feel really great if I just got my way all the time. 
And if everything just, everybody agreed with me, like life would be great. But he says, that's just unrealistic. It's not going to happen. You need to set yourself, you set your mind on things that are above. Second Timothy 2, 4, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. But rather, he tries to please his commanding officer. He's saying, look, there is a spiritual battle going on. And if you have your mind set on civilian affairs, it's like the, the soldier who goes to Iraq and he's just getting caught up in like the soccer game that's happening in Iraq. He's like, oh, man, all these people are just like, like, that's not what you're, you're there for a specific mission. You don't get caught up with these civilian affairs. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a, cloud, a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out with us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, don't collect for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but collect for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where neither where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says, even when it comes to the issue of money, when it comes to money, when it comes to what your mind is fixed on, don't store up things here on earth. Remember, you got to store up things in heaven. You got to think about heaven. You got to be thinking about eternity. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. Set your hope completely, not partially, not like, okay, that's a big part of my hope. I'm hoping for, he's like, no, no, no. your complete hope is not in what's going on politically. It's not in perfect peace in the, in the here and now. He says, your hope is completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. You're always thinking about eternity. You're always thinking about the end game. So if you feel like you're losing hope, what is your hope actually set on? If you're losing your cool, if you're losing your, your confidence, your patience, all of these things, it's like, what is, that, what is your hope focused on? So the, that point is the scriptures continually urge us to look forward to the future day when Christ is going to make all things new. So I don't freak out when things are falling apart in my nation, which I, I grieve over. I, I grieve over seeing the stuff that is happening. But I'm not going to lose my hope over any of that. And I'm not going to place my hope in a person. Hopefully they're going to change that. Like, no, he says that this is all part of the world system. And the world system is all under the sway of the evil one. And you can't expect it to be perfect. In fact, all systems and nations are corrupt. Like when people talk, tell me about the, their conspiracy theories, I'm, I'm like, yeah, probably. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't put it past nobody. <laughs> uh, my, my final please in, in Josh, Joshua um, 5. Joshua 5, 13 through 15. It says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, you think about this, before I even read this, Joshua is about to go into battle. So there's a very real political exchange that's going to happen. Two nations are going to collide, and I'm going into battle. So this is happening. I can't get my mind off of it. If I'm going into battle tomorrow, I'm thinking like, man, I, I'm thinking about just that. My mind is on the situation. And it, all of us would be like that, right? So there's this thing you can't get your mind off of. But when Joshua, he was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up and asked him, are you for us? Are you for our enemies? Because he's looking at his enemies. He says Joshua was near Jericho. He's looking over there. He's seeing what he's plotting. He's thinking about it. And then he sees a man with a drawn sword. He's like, are you for, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence, and he asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. The point in this scripture is that Joshua was facing a very real battle that it was impossible to ignore. Action was needed to happen. But his mind was so fixed on that circumstance that the angel of the Lord had to actually come and visit him. And, and in his mind, he's like, God, are you for me? Are you for them? And he's like, actually, neither of you. I represent the kingdom and the armies of heaven. 
And he says, you need to take your shoes off right now and recognize that the ground you're standing in is holy. And he says, you're in the presence of God right now. And that's what my plea is, is like, guys, we need to be in the presence of God. We need to get our mind off of earthly things, off of all of the things that entangle us, off of all of the things that are distractions from the things that are primary in our faith and in our walk with God. And we need to stand in the presence of God and realize what our call and our great commission is. A lot of people say, Sean, you know, I know where you're coming from, but I can't just sit by and ignore certain issues. And I'm talking about issues on all different sides. I'm not, hopefully you guys don't even know where I fall on any of these things with this because there's all different sides. There's issues of injustice. There's issues of racial tension. There's injustice of, uh, you know, people are very, uh, you know, believing that there was voter fraud and that the election was stolen or like all of these things, you know, there's thoughts on all of this stuff. And like, I'm like, I don't know, probably, maybe, who, who knows? I don't have all the answers. He's like, well, I can't just stand for injustice. It's like, I am un- unjust and I need the just one to come and save me. And that's actually the message we're supposed to be telling to people. Yeah, so I'm not saying don't be involved, but I am saying before you get involved, capture the mind of Christ. What did the angel tell Joshua? If, you're, if your outspoken politics have caused the wedge between you and your brothers or sisters... Right. Just think about that. Just see, have, have you been divided over politics with brothers and sisters in the Lord? Then s- take a step back and reflect on why. The easy thing is to say, because they're all fake Christians. They're all wrong. They are stupid or they're uneducated or they're ignorant or they're not seeing things from my perspective. That's the easy way and just to dismiss them. The hard work of bearing with one another for the sake of unity, like we're commanded to in scripture, we can't, I can't do that. It needs to be the Lord doing that in me. But what, what does the Lord do? He only fashions soft clay. If you have your, your mind made up and you've already hardened your heart towards it, you're like, no, this is just the way it is. It's a very scary place to be because that's where the Pharisees were when they thought they had God all figured out and they couldn't even see Christ through their own ideologies. So takeaways, just as recap, is the kingdoms of men are not the kingdom of God. Therefore, don't forget where your allegiance lies. Christ refused to fit into the political ideologies of his day. Therefore, follow in his footsteps, recognizing that until he returns, you should find yourself politically homeless. Like there is not a neat political party that you should find yourself like, I, I, I'm just a Democrat. I am a Republican. I am a Libertarian. Like you are politically homeless. Why? Because they're all corrupt and and we're looking for the day that Christ returns. The Bible urges us to think spiritually, not earthly. Therefore, set your gaze on Christ in heaven, not on a man or a woman or whoever is in office. Understand the times, but recognize them in light of God's big picture of redemptive history. And by all means, be a good steward of your witness. Think about your witness. Think about the way people perceive you. What do people know you for? I fit into all kinds of different subcultures. Like I own a creative agency. And so I am like with all the creative entrepreneurs and that's like a subculture. And there's like, you know, social media groups and all that kind of stuff that I'm in. I I love premium coffee and I could geek out with people about, you know, single origin pour overs and stuff like that. I find myself in all kinds of different subcultures, but those are supposed to be so far secondary to my identity in Christ. Right. So you could be known for loving music, for, you know, having a particular stance on certain things. But what do people primarily know you as? And if it's identified with anything outside of Christ, take a look back and say, why? Be a good steward of your witness. So there's a couple of uh, questions. Uh, We are going to do questions right now. It's 8.08. I want to be out of here by 8.30. just to respect everybody's time. And so we're, we're going to ask these, the, the teaching is over. I'll end up uh, praying and then we'll ask these two questions and, and kind of dialogue with them. But then I do want to spend a few minutes in prayer, um, at least all of us praying at some point. Uh, so the two questions I want us to interact with is how can we be better stewards of our witness? The second question is how can we engage in political discussions that we're inevitably going to find ourselves in? Right? I'm not talking about how you have done it before. I'm talking about how can we, in light of how God is leading us and what God wants us to be and the witnesses we're supposed to be, how can we engage in those discussions? 
And then the prayer points, um, if there's any immediate prayer needs that you guys have, definitely make those known. If, if, uh, if not, then um, my prayer is for a unified spirit and voice in the church, that we would be known for our love for one another, that we'd be unified in all things and all be saying the same thing and have the same mind in Christ. Uh, my, I pray for an eternal perspective and for Christ to come with revival in the church. And I don't think he's going to do that amongst division. And so with that being said, I'll pray and then we'll, we'll discuss. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. Lord, the word cuts, it's a sword. But I also thank you that it heals. Lord, in preparing this message, you have afflicted my own flesh and you've allowed me to see the planks in my eye and I thank you for that. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you continue your work in sanctification in me and in the people that are here and the people who may be watching. I pray for unity in the body of Christ. Lord, I, I so want you to come with revival in my own life, but also in the church and that it would spread to the world, that the world may see the light of Christ and that it would, the light of Christ wouldn't be shrouded by the darkness in the church. Forgive us, Lord. Be gracious and merciful to us. In Jesus' name, amen.